So in this unit, we're going to see how Americans come together and feel very united on a national level. And we're going to call that nationalism. So we'll see things like the War of 1812, where there's an external or outside threat. And this is going to want to give uh, Americans more power to their federal government. And we're going to see that through different court cases on the Marshall Court. The Transportation Revolution all, will also bring Americans together. Eventually, we will see division as the U.S. moves west, and we'll call that sectionalism. Now, during previous administrations, we discussed how Great Britain and France were at war, and both of them were harassing American sailors. Britain was impressing or kidnapping American sailors and forcing them to work on British ships. This angered many Americans. The British were also interfering or stopping America from trading. So preventing America from trading meant that less money would come back to the United States and hurt the government's economy. Also, the British were supporting Native Americans and rebelling against the United States. So there was a lot of conflict with Great Britain, and they did not respect our sovereignty, which means our freedom. So this war occurs on U.S. soil. The White House is almost burned down to the ground. But the U.S. stops the British from invading and remains sovereign and free. So the effects of this war is that this is going to increase patriotism, which is pride in one's nation. So many Americans are very happy to have won this war. Okay, Even though they're from different regions of the, the country, they feel connected. This is going to weaken the Native American resistance and going to allow for American settlers to start to move further west with less issues with Native Americans. This is not good for the natives. We're going to see a lot of death and destruction, but the United States will move west and add more land to its territory. This war will also increase the U.S. economy and will be a positive thing on the economic front. So there was a, a Congress member named Henry Clay, and he came up with something called the American system. So during the war, we had to rely on ourselves. The United States had to rely on itself to create the goods that it needed. So he proposes a tariff, which is a tax on trade. Right? So anything coming in from another country is going to be more expensive. That's good for the workers in the north, but this may eventually upset the workers in the south because they don't rely on manufacturing. So they're going to have to pay more for goods. So this is good for American workers in the north. Transportation is going to improve. They're going to build roads, canals, bridges, uh, railroad tracks. And this is going to help move raw materials throughout the country. So this will help the U.S. economy. You'll be able to buy more goods. You'll be able to sell more goods. Okay, this is going to connect different regions of the country as well. And that's going to make it easier for the federal government to gain more power as there's more interconnectedness throughout the nation. Uh, so here we see on the map um, the different roads, trains, and canals. Such as in New York, we're going to have the Erie Canal, which is going to connect New York City, the Port of New York, up through the Hudson Valley and over to the Great Lakes so that we can transport goods to the interior of the country, to the Midwest. So things like canals, roads, bridges is good for the U.S. economy. It is going to move Americans westward. And again, it's going to bring the U.S. into conflict in two areas. One, with Native Americans, and two, with the idea of spreading slavery. So a couple important events happened under our fifth president, James Monroe. And as the nation is moving west with this new transportation revolution and a lot of the new wealth, gain after the War of 1812. There's going to be new states added. And the biggest question is, are they going to be free states or are they going to be slave states? There has to be a balance in Congress so that one side does not have too much power in creating laws. So the Missouri Compromise, they look on the line of latitude and say at 36 degrees 30, when you look at a map, any new states to the north will be free. Any new states to the south will be slave. The goal is to keep a balance so that representation in Congress is balanced as we move west.
with foreign policy, looking at other nations, the United States and James Monroe, President Monroe, came up with a policy called the Monroe Doctrine that said in the Western Hemisphere, where the United States is, no more colonies can be created from European nations. They don't want any European nations that have strong armies to be close to the U.S. Also, the U.S. is eventually going to want to be involved in Central and South America and the Caribbean to extract resources and sell goods. And during this time, the head of the Supreme Court, the Chief Justice, is John Marshall. And under John Marshall, he leads a Supreme Court that is going to rule in favor of the federal government. So in court cases like McCulloch v. Maryland and Gibbons v. Ogden, we're going to see that the rulings are important because they increase the power of the federal government. Okay, here I'm just going to quickly annotate some of the different things that we've been discussing as far as nationalism, just on a map so you can have a visual of where some of these things are occurring. If you want to copy these down, this may help your brain make more sense of everything. Otherwise, you can just take a quick look and see if everything makes sense. Again, when you're studying, you should always make a list of terms or topics or even visuals that give you difficulty in bringing them into extra help. As we move on, uh, we're going to see a, the sixth president kind of come into a little bit of controversy. So we call this the corrupt bargain in history because there was a deal made. Again, we didn't have a clear winner in the Electoral College between Andrew Jackson um, and John Quincy Adams, all right, the son of the second president, John Adams. And one of the more influential members of Congress, Henry Clay, helped move Congress in the direction of picking Mr. Adams. So Adams becomes president, and then as a reward, you could think of it, Adams makes Clay, Mr. Clay from Congress, a member of the cabinet position. So Jackson called this the corrupt bargain. So to a more, much more uh, influential president, Andrew Jackson, he was known as being a common man or for the common man. He didn't grow up as a wealthy elite. He didn't have the language or the style of the elite. So a lot of people liked him for that. Similar to the corrupt bargain, Jackson popularized something that was kind of common in politics called the spoils system. Spoils is something that's bad if your food is spoiled. So what he did is he rewarded political supporters, which did upset many. One of the more dark periods of Jackson's presidency was the Indian Removal Act and the Trail of Tears. So many uh, white Americans had found gold in the South and as a result wanted to remove the Native Americans west and relocate them so that they would have access to this gold and to this valuable land which could also be farmed and planted with slaves. So a, a little bit over 16,000 Native Americans and tribes were moved westward of the Mississippi. And in some of these images and photos we see you know, the death and destruction and the sadness of this event where about 25% or 4,000 um, Native Americans died along this perilous journey. It was a pretty sad time. In other domestic issues, we're going to see President Jackson get into some issues with the economy. So again, tariffs are not popular in the South because it raises the cost of buying materials and goods. So Southerners tried to boycott these tariffs because they thought it only helped wealthy Northerners. So in 1832, under President Jackson, the state of South Carolina said, hey, we're not going to pay this tariff. We're going to secede, which means to leave the country. We're going to break away and form our own country. And Jackson was so angry, he threatened to hang okay, the governor of South Carolina. So Congress passed a force bill where they could force Carolina to do this, to pay this tariff. And in doing so, you would have to use the military for that. So the Civil War could have started in 1832. So again, we're seeing the country being pulled apart between states and the federal government, typically on the issue of slavery, but also on other economic issues. 
And again, this is called sectionalism. Now, if we remember back to President George Washington and one of his cabinet members, Alexander Hamilton, the National Bank was proposed, even though it went against what the strict constructionists wanted, and the loose constructionists got the bank. They said, hey, this is necessary and proper. This will help us pay off our debts, attract investors, and have a good economy. And in this cartoon that we're annotating, we see that President Jackson, who's for the common man, he's going to veto the reissuing of this bank. So a bank has a certain amount of time that it can run, and then it has to, the National Bank had to ask Congress for more time. And when Jackson vetoed it, it created a lot of controversy, particularly in the North. Again, he said he's for the common man. So we have a couple other presidents who don't have many things that go on in their presidency that we need to discuss. Okay, we have Martin Van Buren, we have Harrison. But we move on to President Tyler. Um, he's going to rule over the country at a time when westward movement is in full swing. So in this cartoon, we see um, some pr interesting things that we can pick out. So there's the light on the right side, which represents civilization. And we see like a white angelic woman floating over the men who are moving westward and the dark region. And that kind of represents how the dark people are not civilized. So there is a racist element to this as Americans are moving westward. And this is going to create a lot of conflict between native tribes and the United States government. There will be wars. And then eventually a lot of these natives will either be killed, forced to become Americanized, or live on small plots of land called reservations. So as Americans are moving west, one of the areas that they do move in under, under President Polk, was the region called Texas. And Mexico eventually um, invited Americans to move there to help them farm. But they said, no slaves. You cannot have slaves. And unfortunately, a lot of the Americans who moved in there brought slaves and violated a lot of the Mexican law. As a result, the Americans who moved to Texas fought with the Mexicans violently and actually took over that land, kidnapped it, stole it from Mexico. And that was called Texas Independence. After a while, Texas wanted to become part of the United States, so the United States annexed it. And annex means to add. So now you have a position where Mexico invites American workers in. The American workers break the law and then start a revolution. Then the United States government adds that land to its country. Mexico was obviously angry. And after a while, there was a dispute over the border between Mexico and Texas, now part of the United States. And as a result of that, the two nations went to war. And this was called the Mexican-American War. Under this war, the United States, with superior technology, will eventually win this war and capture almost half of Mexico's territory. And we see on the map, the United States is going to gain all that. So that land that the U.S. gains is called Mexican Cession. Mexican because it's from Mexico. And Cession means to give up or to stop. So Mexico gave up that land to stop the war. It didn't want to lose any more land. So this is a controversial war. Many in the North were against it. They thought it was expanding the country in ways it shouldn't do it and other people in the north were very upset because now that land may potentially become slave states some people were angry about this because they thought slavery was immoral and a bad thing but far far more americans did not like slavery because if you were a worker you could not get a job and compete against a slave who did not take any wages so the Mexican-American War on a map looks like a good thing. Hey, the United States gained land. They have more opportunities. But again, it comes at a cost. The cost is the lives of the soldiers of Mexico and the United States. The cost is taking a country's land away and their livelihood. And more central to the United States issues, it's now the cost of slavery and the issue of slavery expanding. 